Hey everybody, welcome to A Psychology. I am Miss M and today we are going to talk about Milgram's shocking experiment. This was done in 1963 um, and this is all time favorite uh, research article. So um, if you don't know this one, you, you got to know it and um, it's got to stick with you through life. So let's get ready and um, let's go through Milgram. So the background of Milgram, this might be the one that you're most familiar with from other classes like history class. So um, this is done in 1963 and, and maybe a decade before um, we have World War II. Um, I believe that ended around 1944, 1945, maybe the summer of 1945, like officially. Um, and here we have Stanley Milgram during World War II, who is in high school, and um, he is part German himself. So he starts to get all these ideas and thoughts about, you know, if if the Germans, well, there were more than just Germans, not, I'll just say Nazis, um, if Nazis were able to listen to a man um, to the point that they are willing to kill other individuals um, and, and obey his orders, then is this possible to happen again? Are we... Um, basically paving the way for another mass murder like this. It just doesn't make sense why people would listen to a short little man who had health problems, who was from Austria and wasn't really even German himself. So he is telling people to murder individuals that are not German, that are not healthy, that are basically everything that he is. Um, so a little messed up, but we're not going to talk about Hitler in that sense. We're going to talk about the fact that Stanley Milgram was questioning why these people did this, and and his dispositional hypothesis was that it had to be something innate, something within the German race, something in their DNA that enabled them to um, to listen. And you know, although he may have thought of that as a hypothesis in this study. That is not the hypothesis. The, the hypothesis is actually the opposite. It's called the situational hypothesis. And um, there was a point where he himself, who was German, believed that he couldn't do those things. So his hypothesis fits his study. He believed that if you put someone in a certain situation, that their ability to behave in a certain way, you know, goes out the door, that their behavior is subject to their environment. Now, let's think about Germany during that time in the early 40s. They just surrendered World War I. They were down. They had, they, they didn't have that nationalism that they had going into World War I. Um, their people were getting sick. There was no food. Um, it, it was dirty. It was a bad, it was a bad time. And, um, you know, here we have this guy who steps up to the plate and says, if you're not gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, follow me. And basically people just go with him because in their mind, what's better than where they're living in dirt and famine and disease, you know, something's gotta be better than this. So that situation that they were put in of, you know, low income, low food, high disease and famine, you know, they were looking for a way out. So the hypothesis, the situational hypothesis, saying that it is the environment that made these people listen to Hitler's orders, that is why that the mass murdering occurred. So we're going to we're gonna go through this study, and um, you're going to see how Milgram attempted to um, reconstruct this type of um, obedient behavior to the point of destruction, but we didn't actually hurt anyone in this experiment, and that's really important for you to know. I know a lot of people assume that we are actually shocking people, but um, there was only one shock that was done, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So let's get into the methodology of the study. All right, so let's dive in. The psychology that's being investigated, it's basically the idea that we can explain events such as the Holocaust um, by reference to the social processes operating in the situation. So basically the society and what's going on around you, um, rather than the characteristics of the individual involved. So um, if we were to have a situational hypothesis, it's basically stating that the environment's going to make participants behave the way they are. And um, if we have a, an individual um, or dispositional hypothesis, then we're saying it's the individual, it's something within their DNA, it's something in their personality that's making them behave that way. All right, and this is all related to social psychology and um, how we react to people, how we interact, how we interact with groups and out of groups. 
All right. So the aim was to investigate how obedient people would be to orders from an authority figure that would result in pain or harming another individual. Um, more specifically, basically, we wanted to see how large the electric shock um, a participant would give to another participant. So if you can imagine, Milgram created this box. And on this box, if you look in your book, you will see um, a nice little picture of this box that has little gadgets on it and dials and um, numbers. And there's even some words on it. So he created this shock machine. It didn't actually shock anyone. It wasn't connected to anything that said um, it went from 15 volts to 450 volts. So if you guys know voltage, 450 volts is lethal, deadly. Um, and he had little knobs on there. So each switch you could go through and um, each switch that you hit, it went up 15 volts all the way to 450, okay? Um, <clears throat> so he created this machine to use in the experiment. Now we already have deception because this machine didn't actually work. Um, but the participants were made to think that it would work. All right, so um, I already explained before, he believes in the situational hypothesis. He thought that people would be obedient to an authority figure, but he didn't know how far um, they would obey his orders. And I believe that Milgram even asked other researchers during that time. Um, there's a great video, actually, if you go on YouTube and you search for the Milgram study, um, you can see a long... Uh, video in black and white from the original footage because we do have cameras. It's an observation, laboratory observation. So um, he asked other researchers how far he thought participants would go. And the researchers answered that they thought that Milgram would be lucky if one person went. Um, he didn't even, I don't even, they didn't even think that people would get, would even start shocking people. Um, that's what they truly believed. Because if I asked you right now, would you shock someone to death if, you know, your teacher told you to, um, you, you probably say no, but you wouldn't know until you were in the situation. So our methodology, we have a laboratory experiment, um, with observations. Now this is our first pilot study. And if you can think of a pilot, like a, a TV show, a pilot's like what they put on just to test it, to see if people are interested in it. So there's not a lot of structure. Um, they might even do some content that's not really related to the story, the, the, the real series. So that's kind of what Milgram is doing. He's putting together this experiment, but it's not really an experiment because we all have, we only have one condition of the independent variable. Every, actually, there is no independent, independent variable because there's just one condition. There's no control groups. Everyone went through the exact same process, um, standardized procedures to the T. All right. So yes, we could replicate this study, but uh, not due to the inhumanity of it. So um, our designs, it's only one condition um, and participants, I guess, were repeatedly measured because every continuous shock was another measurement. And basically, um, our dependent variable, we are looking to see what each individual will end as their maximum shock. Okay. So let's talk about our sample. So this is very, very important to the aim of the study. We have 40 men ages 20 to 50. How did we get these men? We put an ad in the newspaper. And uh, I think this, these uh, gentlemen came from two cities in Connecticut. I only know one in says New Haven, Connecticut in the book. I know there's another city. You might have to watch a documentary to catch that though. Um, that's not really important. Just knowing that they're all from Connecticut and knowing you can't generalize outside of that, that's all you need to know. So we have 40 men and we put an ad out in the paper saying that we were looking for participants for a study on learning and memory. Now, we are in the early 60s, so think of the time period. Um, we didn't aim it just towards men, but we only had men respond to the ad, and um, we had a lot of people respond to the ad. Um, but Milgram needed to do like a second type of intervention to make sure that he had a broad range of participants. Now, what does that mean? Think about his aim. He's doing a study on obedient behavior. You need to pick a population that you can study. You don't want to pick a population that's going to give you the answer. Like, why would you choose 
that's five-year-olds to do a study on obedient behavior. You know a five-year-old is going to obey orders. So his job was to find people with different types of professions, professions that people were used to giving orders, maybe like a judge um, or a, a boss of a company. Um, and he was also, that's that would be like white collar. And he was also looking for people of blue collar status. So people that were used to taking orders more so, like um, maybe a secretary or a janitor or a mechanic, I'm not sure. So blue collar and white collar participants in the study is so important because we are studying obedient behavior. We we need an array of participants, okay? And this is just gonna make our generalization to different occupations um, a little bit better. So let's go over the procedure. All right, so our participants were asked to come to Yale University where the study was going to be conducted. So think of this environment. We have a prestigious university if you're going to Yale, you probably assume that people know what they're doing there, correct? Um, keep that in mind as we go through the study. Now, you're the participant. This is where I want you to close your eyes and imagine you being in this study, okay? You arrive to Yale and you walk in this room and there's a man standing there in a lab coat. He introduces himself as the experimenter and he says that you're going to do a study on learning and memory. Now, already sitting next to you is another gentleman who you are introduced as another participant in the study. Okay, so um, deception all around. The whole thing is deception. Now, the, exper the um, experimenter explains to these two gentlemen, which one is named Mr. Wallace, and he is a confederate, which is also known as a stooge. And this person is going to pretend to be a participant, but after behind closed doors, He's actually really just part of the study, like the experimenter. It's important to know Milgram was not the experimenter in the study. We were just observing from afar. So we have two confederates, two confederates, um, two stooges, the, the guy in the lab coat and Mr. Wallace. So he explains that research has shown that people learn better when they get punished after giving the incorrect answer. We know now that is not correct. Out of all the possibilities of classical conditioning, Positive uh, punishment is the least effective. We know that now, but they didn't know in 1963. So it was a good cover. So he says, we're gonna conduct this study and um, I need one of you to be the teacher and one of you to be the learner. So in that moment, our participant believed he actually had a 50-50 chance of being the learner or um, the teacher. And that's important too, because at the end, I mean, when people are shocking Mr. Wallace, you have to remember that it could have been them. It, it could have been, we know it couldn't have, but they should know that it could have been them because there was a 50-50 chance of them being the teacher or the learner. So we call that drawing for lots, okay? So if you hear drawing for lots, that means that we are just drawing out of a bucket, a little cup um, that says, in our piece of paper says teacher or it says learner. But in fact, every single time that, you know, the participant, you, reached in and pulled it out, it said you were the teacher, okay? So you get the teacher status and the experiment begins. So you're, the experimenter walks you and Mr. Wallace to the back. Now he's gonna set Mr. Wallace up first so you, the participant, can see this and that you can think that this experiment is even more real. So we go in the back and Mr. Wallace sits down and he starts to kind of talk about the shocking and the voltages, which this is the first time that they hear of this. They don't know this is gonna happen. And they actually give the participant, you, the participant, they give you a 45 volt shock to make you believe that the shock machine is real, okay? This is so important. This is a control of the study. Remember that, a 45, 45 volt shock, okay? That was the control. If you have to think that the shock machine went all the way to 450 volts, 45 volts was the shock given to um, the participant to make them believe that the shock machine was real, okay? We are just improving validity at this point. So Mr. Wallace, before the participant leaves, Mr. Wallace even says, you know, I have a heart condition and I just wanna make sure that these shocks aren't, aren't going to hurt my heart. I'm not gonna have a heart attack. And the um, experimenter responds with, um, 
well, he basically, he doesn't say no, but he does respond with the fact that the shocks are such low voltage that he, um, he should be fine. All right. So, um, he basically leaves him there and, uh, the participant, you remember, you are the participant, you leave the room with the experimenter. And when you do that, Mr. Wallace takes off all his stuff because he's not really being hooked up to the shock machine and he prepares his recordings. Yes, his recordings. So if you, if you listen or watch this on YouTube, you have to know that these, the yelling and the screaming that you hear, it's all, it's all recording so that each participant had the same exact experience. Okay, so you go into this room and you are sitting in front of this box, okay? And this is your shock machine. And everything that you know so far tells you that it's real, okay? We hooked Mr. Wallace up. He complained about his heart condition. We told him it shouldn't be, should be okay. We gave you, the participant, a 45-volt shock. It wasn't connected to the shock machine. It was connected to something else. Um, but we did that to make sure that we were, you know, believable in the study and then we bring you to this other side and you have this shock machine in front of you and again it goes from zero to 450 volts okay i'm sorry well there's a zero on there but the study says 15 volts to 450 volts so um you're instructed to read these word pairings okay and you know I don't a hundred percent understand the pairings as, uh, when I listen to them, but that's not so much important on what he's asking the question. What's important to know is that Mr. Wallace already, we, we already decided which questions he was going to get wrong. Everything was pre-recorded from this point on. So, so really that shock machine didn't really matter. And the participants weren't really shocking Mr. Wallace. We were just we wanted them to believe that they were, and we wanted to see how far they would go on this shock generator, okay? So they were instructed that every time a participant, our participant, got their answer incorrect, so they would say, like, um, tree, and then they would give, like, four examples, green, leaf, fluffy, cat. <laughs> um, I don't exactly know the answer to that, but it was, basically, that was it. Basically, all you really need to know is that there were 30 switches from 15 to 450, and um, every time the participant got the question wrong, or Mr. Wallace got the question wrong, our participant had to hit the little shock, shock Mr. Wallace, and then go on to the next question. So this happened repeatedly for every single participant. Um, definitely recommend go on there, go on to YouTube and search for the video and watch some of these participants. So we basically have two types of data that we're getting here. We have quantitative data, which is the number on the shock generator, the shock machine where people stopped. And we have qualitative data. The qualitative data comes from the observations. It comes from the things people said other than what they were supposed to read. It comes from the fact that they were shaking and that they were bouncing their legs and some people were crying and some people were laughing out of being uncomfortable. So that information is is really important and we went through each participant we gathered data on each participant in the same fashion now something else that happened we didn't just let participants go and read the questions and you know shock someone and then move on we have this experimenter now remember this is obedient to the point of destruction so this experimenter's job is to push our participant to 450 volts interesting now when our participants, now many of them did, when our participants were hesitant or showed that they possibly didn't want to shock, do we have to shock, our experimenter had to say prods. We called them prods or they were, they were sayings that were um, created to motivate the participants to keep going. Um, like, for instance, you must continue this experiment. This experiment requires you to continue please go on. So um, those prods are also controls of the study because the things that the participants, um, the, I'm sorry, the things that the experimenter said are really important if you're going to replicate the study. You want to have those same sayings. You want to have the same phrases there because we, we can't push someone to the limits with a certain phrase and then be really nice and calm with another individual, right? We can't, we can't, 
just um, say really mean things to one and push them to the edge. It's, it's not consistent across all participants. So these four prods were consistent. They were said, um, please continue. The experiment requires you to continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue and you have no choice. You must continue. So I believe that these are definitely persuasive types of, of sayings. They're definitely going to get our participants to think twice. Um, is this some type of um, ob obedient behavior that's going to occur after they continue? Um, is the obedient behavior happening when they reach the 450? So um, let's think about the experiment in terms of validity. So are we measuring what we intended to measure? We're measuring obedient behavior. Um, now, remember, through this whole ordeal, Mr. Wallace is screaming and yelling. And um, this happened mostly around, um, you know, the middle of the experiment. Once we got to like 300 volts, Mr. Wallace went silent because he was complaining about his heart the whole time. My heart, I have this condition. Please stop. No, I don't want to continue. He would he wouldn't answer on purpose. And then our experimenter would push our participant to keep hitting those switches and to keep shocking them. Um, and you know, if they were hesitant or they started laughing or I don't want to do this anymore, here our experiment is, um, the experiment requires you to continue. And a majority of them turned around and kept going. Now at 300 volts, Mr. Wallace went silent. Now that can be, that, that's interesting because if someone's saying that they're, they're hurting and their, uh, their heart, something wrong with their heart and then they go quiet, do you think they're dead? Would you? D did our participants think that they were dead? I don't know what they were thinking, but they continued to shock Mr. Wallace. 63% of our participants went all the way to 450 volts. And even if you watch the video, there's a participant that keeps going after 450. He keeps hitting the 450 switch after Mr. Wallace is completely silent. What is that saying? All right. Now there's a, there's a, there's key. There's a key phrase that happens in this study that they don't talk about in the study, but they, you see it in the videos. Okay. Majority of the participants turn to the experimenter and they say, who's taking responsibility if this guy dies? I'm not shocking this guy. I'm not going to kill this guy. Who is responsible for this? And the experimenter says, I am. So right there, we see the blame is, is being put on another individual which is almost allowing the participant to continue with this destructive behavior. Isn't that crazy? It's if we take the blame and put it in someone else's hand, it's almost like saying that we're, we're capable of doing anything as long as we're not going to be held responsible for it. That's really nuts. That's crazy, right? So after the participants either made it to 450 or, or they gave up. I think everyone made it to at least 300 volts. Everyone in the study made it to 300 volts. 100%. That's crazy. 100% made it to 300 volts. And 63% made it to 450 volts, killing Mr. Wallace. If this was a true experiment, there, we would have had 63% of our participants kill another individual because someone told them to. That's insane. But why was it done? That's the important part. Now, think about this setting. You're at Yale University. Prestigious. You have a guy in a lab coat. He's probably really smart and he knows what he's doing, right? So this situation seems real. It seems legit. It seems safe. And then we have this man of authority in this lab coat says that he'll take all the responsibility. So at this point, we're just little pawns. Um, that's scary to think about, right? Where do we get this from? Our, you know, we teach children at a young age to obey authority, to obey orders. But why? Where is that going to get everyone in the world? I, I don't know the answer to this. And I think about this all the time when I'm raising my kids. Yeah, I want them to do what I'm telling them to do. But because it's making my life easier, not because it's making their life easier. Do I want to teach them to obey orders to the point where they could be someone's pawn? I don't know the answer to that. But it's, it's important to look at what happened after the study too, because Milgram was shocked. 
He was shocked. All of all of the researchers were shocked that this happened, that participants went all the way to 450 volts. This is nuts. So why did they do it? It had to be his hypothesis, the situation. So let's do this and test this a different way. Because remember, it's a pilot study. So there's, you know, there's no independent variables and conditions and whatnot. So he just redid this experiment in a different setting. He said, okay, let's do it in like a rundown office building. I don't know 100% of the details, but this is the gist of it. So I think you can get away with just the gist of it. Um, he redid this experiment and he did it in like a rundown office building, I believe. And um, there was a 20% or so decrease, maybe more, decrease in obedient behavior just because the environment did not look legit because they weren't in Princeton. I'm um, sorry. Yes, that's where they were. Uh, Yale, not Princeton. Yeah. Now, that's telling us that the environment is going to change the behavior. Now, what about the person in the lab coat? What if we change the authority figure so they didn't look so authoritarian, right? Because we have Hitler and he is dressed in this uniform because, you know, he was a messenger in World War One. He was not, um, he, he was not fighting combat. He was, he was a messenger, um, but he still had the uniform. So this uniform, if we take this uniform away, if we take this authority away, will participants still listen? So in this next study, what they did was, um, they did it similar to the first one, except halfway through the study, we had someone come in in normal, regular clothes and tell the experimenter that they had a phone call or something. And um, the experimenter left, and then that person like continued the experiment. And again, we find that people decreased in obedient behavior. So all this is, is showing us that the situational hypothesis is correct. It wasn't that there's something in DNA of people that are of German descent. Um, it's nothing in their personality. We took average Americans in the 1960s from Connecticut and we put them in this experiment to see if they would kill another human being, basically. And 63% of them did. So if, if Americans in the 1960s will do it, similar fashion to the Germans in 1945, then it has to be the environment. It can't be the person. Because if it was the person, then the Americans wouldn't have done it, right? All right, now um, let's just dive into some statistics of the results and what this main conclusion is of the study. Um, I know in, in your class, you're probably gonna talk about ethics. This is a huge one. You could have a two-day Socratic seminar on the ethics of this study. You could argue we needed this, and but we didn't need this, and why did we do this, and it's immoral this way. Um, we'll talk about that um, at the end, but right now let's go into some results. Okay, so if you have a pen and paper, write this down. These are our findings. These are the most important pieces of information, and you could be asked to recall some results from Milgram's study because it is it is one for the book. So um, all participants gave shocks up to and including 285 five volts. So when I said everyone made it to 300, that means the 285 was right before. Everyone's shocked at 285. And then once we get to that 300 volt, um, I believe it says there was like one person. Um, oh no, at the 300 volt, five people dropped off. Okay. Um, five out of 40 participants withdrew um, at that 300 volt. So that's what I just said. Um, 26 participants went to the full 450 volts. That's about 60 to 63% of the population. Many participants showed signs of nervousness, sweating, trembling, stuttering, biting their lip, um, digging their fingernails into their flesh, um, nervous laughter, full-blown uncontrollable seizures. That did happen to one participant. Okay. One participant did have a seizure. Um, Basically, one was very severe. I think three three people had seizures and one was really severe. Um, most participants were convinced that the situation was real. So we have a man in a lab coat. We are at Yale, a prestigious university. They believed it was real. When asked about how painful the shock, the shocks were at the end uh, for the learner on a 14-point scale, the mean rating was a 13.42. What is that saying? It's saying our participants knew that that shock hurt like hell and they still did it. A 13.42. I believe that they were, they probably didn't get to that full 14 just to make themselves feel a little bit better. So how do we know any of this information? We debriefed 
after it was done, after our participants basically finally gave up um, and refused to go on, like completely refused. They didn't say, I don't want to do this and then turn around and kept going. They completely refused. We had to debrief them, tell them that this was just an experiment, and then ask them a few questions about how they felt. So the main conclusion here, um, Milgram found that Germans were not different, that U.S. citizens in the 1960s obeyed an authority figure with, uh, when instructed. Another conclusion, although most of the participants obeyed, they were far from happy in doing so. The signs of tension and stress indicate that mental torture they were experiencing. So this was really difficult. And, and we have a lot of ethics to consider here. Um, the only explanation Milgram gives for why people did what they did, um, why did people obey authority? It was conducted um, at the pre prestigious Yale University. So it was scientific. There was scientific equipment. Um, it looked like an experiment. The participants felt obliged to continue, right? You must continue. That was, um, that is definitely debatable on the terms of um, right to withdraw. So that's the big question. Did our participants have the right to withdraw? And technically speaking, they did. But part of the experiment was to make them feel like they didn't. And I know people will say, well, maybe they thought that they wouldn't get the money because there was like a small incentive. I think it was like, oh, I can't remember right now. $3.50 for the experiment, I think. And um, that's like comparable, like 30 bucks today. But if they needed the money, right when they got there in, in the beginning of the experiment, I remember the experimenter says to them, like, you both get paid for this. And from this point on, you can leave whenever you want to, or you could, you'll still get paid from this point on, no matter what you do. So they knew they could leave, but part of the experiment was to make them believe they couldn't leave. So do we really exercise the right to withdraw? Some people say yes. Some people say no. What do you think? Let me know. Tell me below. What do you think? Is right to withdraw there? Um, we already talked about deception. There's definitely deception all over the place here. Um, the stooge, if there's a stooge, there's always deception. We have confidentiality. That's good. We don't know who is who. Um, now, physical and psychological harm. We definitely breached that. Our participants were sweating. Some had seizures. All right. And that's a big reason why we can't replicate this study to, to this point of um, psychological harm. You know, I, I don't know if a lot of you guys remember um, or even know who Zimbardo is in his prison experiment. I know that there's a show on Netflix that you should watch. Don't watch it with other kids in the room because um, it's pretty R rated. But I actually don't even know where I was going with that. Uh, okay. So, oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Zimbardo. Sorry. Um, psychological harm. So in Zimbardo's prison experiment, um, after he had, after he ended his experiment, which was completely unethical, a lot of participants started to get physically ill from psychological harm. So you can, you can have stomach aches, um, pains, you can develop rashes on your body. So the amount of stress that Milgram put our participants in psychological harm was there. Now, what is debatable about these ethics? Well, the debate is whether or not we needed this all to occur. Could we have done this a different way? All right. So, um, generalizability of the study. We only have participants from New Haven, Connecticut. They are all male. Yes, they have a majority of backgrounds, but, um, it's, it's a gender bias here and it's uh, ethnocentric. They're all white males. So, um, reliability, this one's awesome. We have so many standardized procedures. If you were asked a control of the study, you could basically name anything. You could name drawing for lots. You could name the 45 volt shock. You could, um, name the, the 15, the increments of 15 on, on the shock generator. You could name the four prods. There's basically these, all these steps that occurred, occurred exactly the same for every participant. So we're going to call those a control. Um, and if we were to reproduce the study, we would have no problem because our reliability in the study is really good. Application. How do we apply this to the real world? Think about the conclusion. 
we figured out that people will behave this way if the situation calls for it, right? So using this in the real world, we can use this for our own personal gain. Put yourself in situations and environments that are going to help you to succeed, that are going to help you be a positive person. You know, when your parents say like, oh, you're hanging around with the wrong crowd. They are right. It's this study. It's telling you that the situation and the people that you hang out with, that's going to de depict your behavior. If you're hanging out with a lot of people that do um, some pretty bad things on a regular basis, you're probably going to end up doing those things too. Even if you look today in your parents' face and you say, I'm not capable of it, the situation can change you. It's, we see it here. So let's say for instance, a child is, has all these behavioral problems when they go to school, but at home, I'm like, why are they not behaving this bad? And the teacher said that they're, they're behaving horrible at school. So I am probably going to go to that school and look at the situation. I'm going to look at the environment. Who's my kid sitting next to? What, what's, go, what's on the walls, right? We don't see any pink rainbows and butterflies and unicorns and kittens on the walls in prison. That's why it's, that's why it's a horrible, you know, depressed place. So it's the situation that can create behavior. That's what we're talking about here for application. Validity. Tricky, tricky. Okay. Ecological validity, it's lab. So I'm going to say no ecological validity. Internal validity, did we measure what we intended to measure? I have no freaking idea. You know why? Because here we have this guy screaming on the other side of this wall. Are we measuring how long it takes for someone to go help him? Are we measuring how long, how much obedient, how much we're listening to this guy say, okay, yeah, I'll keep shocking. Are we, well, what are we measuring? I, and I know the answer is simple. Yeah, we're measuring the shock voltage, but you need to think outside the box with this question. All right. What if there was a kid on the other side and it wasn't Mr. Wallace? What if it was a dog? I think that if there was a dog yelling on the other side for help, that we would have helped him quicker than we helped Mr. Wallace. Why? All right, so validity. Did we measure what we intended to measure? Ethics. We went over the ethics. Okay, confidentiality is good. Everything else. Okay, we needed to deceive people. But did we need to implement this much psychological harm? Is there a way that we could have told participants that they could have left the study and actually had them believe they could leave the study? What if some felt pressured to stay because they didn't think they could leave? So with all this, um, we have this historical document um, that basically says that humans will obey orders to the point of destruction depending on their situation. So let's use this for good. Let's make sure that our situations are always happy and positive so we don't end up in, in those scenarios. Let's use this for good and not teach people or try to, try to push people to, to the limits by making them do something that they don't want to do. There are many evil people in the world that do that. They know they can do that. The study shows them that they can do that. Okay? Um, if you have any other questions about Milgram... Um, I could talk all day about Milgram. So, uh, throw something in comments below. I am really quick to answer. Also, if you need a little bit more help with a psychology, you can join my Google classroom. All you have to do is subscribe, send me an email with the subject line, Google classroom, and I will send you an invite. I'm usually really good about doing that within the same day. Um, you can always join me on Instagram at a psychology. Um, and then I have uh, my Gmail, apsychology9990. So there is a Facebook page. There's a couple of videos on there. But honestly, if you try to contact me any one of those three ways, um, I'll probably get back to you. So stay tuned for some more um, apsychology videos. And thanks for joining me today. Bye, guys.